Frederick William Victor Albert, later known as Kaiser Wilhelm II, was born in Berlin in 1859 to Princess Victoria and German Emperor Frederick III. Wilhelm II had a traumatic birth and was unfortunately born with a disability that made his left arm smaller and essentially useless. Wilhelm blamed this on his mother, and historians believe that this is where Wilhelm's hatred for the British started, which grew even stronger due to a British physician that practiced electrotherapy and other absurd procedures on the future Kaiser. The Kaiser was known to be intelligent, but had a quick temper and a very strong personality. This later caused problems in his reign, such as the Daily Telegraph affair, where the Kaiser publicly offended the British by saying, You English are mad, mad, mad as marches. Wilhelm II didn't align much with the British ideals of democracy and liberalism, but much rather preferred the German standards of nationalism and traditionalism. Wilhelm wanted a stronger Germany to compete with his cousins, Tsar Nicholas II and George V, which he believed was achievable by growing German industries, military and navy. The constitution of the new German Empire made the Kaiser the most powerful figure in Germany, as Wilhelm was in absolute control of the army, foreign policy and was able to appoint the Chancellor, who ran the government and was able to propose new legislation. Under the Chancellor was the Bundesrat, representatives from each German state who consented to the laws passed by the Chancellor. These, however, could be overruled by the Kaiser. And finally, there's the Reichstag, who were elected every three years or five after 1888 and could pass or reject legislation handed down by the Bundesrat. The Kaiser's dream of a stronger Germany became true as it had an economic boom from 1890 to 1924 and by the start of the 20th century, Germany was mainland Europe's most powerful nation. Iron and coal production in Germany doubled and Germany now produced two-thirds of Europe's steel. This economic boom also saw the creation of new exciting industries such as chemical and electrical manufacturing. This rapid industrialization, however, wasn't all good for the Kaiser, as due to an increase in the working class and poor working conditions, the people now wanted change. This led to a rise in socialism, and in particular, the rise of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, also known as the SPD. The rise of the SPD was evident, and its seats in the Reichstag increased from 11 in 1887 to 81 by 1903. By 1914, 3.3 million people were involved with trade unions in Germany. This was a big threat to the Kaiser and his power, and the possibility of a socialist revolution threatened Germany. Out of fear of promoting socialist ideals, the government didn't pass any reform, which made it even worse as people got angrier and supported more radical political parties. This was an endless cycle for the Kaiser, as passing socialist legislation made socialist ideas more popular, and not passing any legislation made socialist ideas even more popular. So what was the Kaiser's response? War. The Kaiser hoped to distract the people by passing a series of laws to encourage nationalism and military pride, as his Workers' Protection Act of 1891 wasn't enough. Wilhelm hoped to increase his support with the idea of Weltpolitik, which was imperialist foreign policy that expanded Germany's armed forces and its territory. This wasn't enough, which motivated the Kaiser to pass the Navy Law in 1898. The main goal of the Navy laws was to build and improve Germany's naval fleet to compete with its mortal enemy, the British and its mighty Royal Navy, which had dominated the seas for the past century. However, the secret main objective of the Navy laws was propaganda to increase patriotism and decrease the popularity of radical parties such as the SPD. This was very successful, as the SPD lost 36 seats in 1907. The Navy laws were effective, and Germany increased its number of battleships to 19 by 1903. This caught the eye of the British, who answered by designing a powerful ship that had never been seen before, the HMS Dreadnought. This started an arm race as Germany answered by ordering the construction of 8 Dreadnoughts. This worried the British who ordered 11 more Dreadnoughts. The Germans didn't slow down and only offered to stop the arms race if the British entered an alliance with them. Britain's final answer came thanks to the idea of Winston Churchill, who created a program that produced 2 Dreadnoughts for every one produced by the Germans. The naval arms race was overall won by the British, as by 1914, Germany had only produced 17 dreadnoughts, and Britain, 29. The naval laws worsened Anglo-German relations, and it is argued that it possibly led to World War I as we know it, as it pushed Germany closer to Austria-Hungary and the British closer to the French and the Russians.
This is Germany in 1918. Their last chance to overrun the Allies to finalize the war failed, and an overpowered American army landed in Europe, making their already exhausted army even more desperate. Due to a British naval blockade that had been going on for the entire war, Germany suffered food, medicine, and clothing shortages, making the war a living hell for its troops and its civilian population. I also forgot to mention that the most severe pandemic in recent history, the Spanish flu or 1918 influenza, was raging across the German Empire, killing an estimated quarter of a million Germans. By 1918, Germany was desperate. This motivated General Ludendorff to advise the Kaiser to create a new civilian government, as he believed that Germany could possibly be treated more fairly if it became more democratic. The Kaiser listened and tried to create a parliamentary monarchy led by Prince Max based on Reichstag support. This failed as it was not democratic enough. On October 31st, 1918, the Kiel mutiny occurred, as sailors refused to go on a suicidal attack against British ships. Many other soldiers and civilians joined this mutiny and refused to continue the war any further. By late 1918, the Kaiser lost hope and control of the army, as mass strikes and riots continued. On November 9th, the Kaiser abdicated and escaped to the Netherlands, never to return to Germany again. That same day, Prince Max handed over the chancellorship to SPD leader Friedrich Ebert, and Germany, for the first time, was declared a republic. Armistice was finally signed on November 11th, 1918, marking the end of the war. In January 1919, the victors met in Versailles to discuss what to do with Germany and its people. Germany was not invited. This is what Germany lost. Alsace-Lorraine was allocated to the French. North Schleswig was lost to the Danish. Eupen Malmedy was given back to the Belgians. Memo was lost to Lithuania. And a Polish corridor was created to separate East Prussia from the rest of Germany. The industrial heartland of the German Empire, the Saar Coalfields, and the port city of Danzig became a free city under the control of the League of Nations, to which Germany was not invited to. The Allies also demilitarized the Rhineland and confiscated all German overseas colonies. These territorial losses meant that 12% of the German population was lost. Germany also lost 75% of its iron ore, 68% of its zinc ore, and 26% of its coal. During the treaty, the Allies agreed that Germany had to pay back war reparations, which added up to 6.6 .6 billion pounds. Army restrictions were also set on Germany that prevented it from owning any tanks, air force, or submarines, and limited its number of battleships to six. The German army was limited to a total of 100,000 men. However, what annoyed the German people the most was Clause 231, which forced Germany to accept the blame for starting and prolonging the war. Many saw this as unfair and insulting. After the SPD gained control of the government in the 1919 elections, they held their first meeting in the town of Weimar, hence the name of the new government. The first thing that they did was set up a new constitution, and this is how it worked. At the bottom, there's the people. Everyone who was over 20 could vote. The people elected the Reichstag, whose deputies were elected based on proportional representation. These representatives were elected every four years. Over the Reichstag were the chancellor and his ministers, who proposed laws to the Reichstag. The chancellor is appointed by the president, who was elected every seven years by the people. The president also commanded the army and could dissolve the Reichstag and arrange new elections. The president also possessed a new power named Article 48, which in case of an emergency gave the president full dictatorship-like powers. I'm sure that won't cause any problems in the future. Was this constitution good? The advantages of this constitution were that it had fair and equal representation for everyone over 20 years old. There was a balance of power and a constant rotation of leaders. Some disadvantages was that proportional representation led to too many parties that struggled to agree and cooperate. Proportional representation also allowed extremist parties that didn't believe in democracy to have a say and possibly be able to get power. And finally, Article 48 gave too much power to the president in case of an emergency. The Treaty of Versailles left Germany in crippling debt and also took away its money-making industry. This meant that Germany owed a lot of money and didn't have any way of paying it back. By 1922, all the money produced by the government was being paid straight back to the Allies. The lack of reparations being paid made the French impatient, who in 1923 occupied the Ruhr with an army of 60,000 men. This was a catastrophe for Germany, as it lacked sufficient army and the Ruhr produced 85% of its coal. This stunt didn't go well for the French, as German workers in the Ruhr went on strike and refused to work. As time went by, the number of soldiers increased to 100,000. The occupation lasted until 1925. The German government, running even more desperate and even more in debt, decided to print more money to pay back its reparations quicker. 
This made the situation worse, as printing more money causes something called inflation, which makes money worth less. The German government printed so much money that it caused hyperinflation. This lowered the value of the mark tremendously, which increased extreme poverty and made the middle class disappear. Years of economic and political instability led to three significant attempts to overthrow the Weimar government. The first one was the Spartacist Revolt, which was a communist revolution attempt led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. The revolution was not strong or organized enough to work and was stopped by the government with the help of the Freikorps, who were ex-soldiers and military volunteer units. The next attempt was made by the Freikorps itself, who turned on the government and marched on the streets. The overthrow was led by Wolfgang Kapp, but the revolt was stopped as workers went on strike and marched in the streets, which stopped the Freikorps. The last and closest attempt was the Munich Putsch, which was organized by an unknown man named Adolf Hitler and the much respected General Ludendorff. On the 8th of November 1923, Gustav Ritter von Kahr, the Bavarian Prime Minister, was addressing a room full of businessmen in a beer hall in Munich. Out of nowhere, Hitler disrupted the room accompanied by 600 stormtroopers that surrounded the beer hall and screamed, The National Revolution has begun! He took Carr and Lasso, the Bavarian army officer, into a side room, holding them at gunpoint. Meanwhile, Hitler had commanded the rest of his stormtroopers to terrorize other members of the Bavarian government in different locations around the city, but they were not able to control any army barracks. Back at the beer hall, Hitler was becoming more desperate and threatened to shoot both ministers and himself if they didn't agree to pack him up. They reluctantly agreed and were forced to announce their support for the putsch in front of everyone. After this, Hitler mistakenly let Karr and Lasso go, but remained with Ludendorff to plan the overthrow of the government and march to Berlin the next morning, unaware that Karr had tipped off the government. The next cold morning, Hitler and Ludendorff led an army of 2,000 men to a military base in the center of Munich. Ludendorff was confident that the police and the military wouldn't shoot at their former commander, but he was dead wrong. As the Nazis marched, they were met by armed police and Bavarian soldiers who immediately shot at them. Hitler, stunned by the commotion, fell to the ground and dislocated his shoulder. He was able to escape, but was caught two days later and imprisoned. General Ludendorff continued to march, but he was arrested right after. The Munich Putsch resulted in three dead policemen and 16 dead Nazis. On the 13th of August 1923, Gustav Stressmann was appointed Chancellor of the new and unstable Weimar Republic. Even though he served as chancellor for only three months, Stressman was responsible for shifting the trust in the republic and started a period many describe as a golden age. From 1924 to 1929, Germany saw economic recovery and a cultural development fueled by Stressman's policies. Thanks to a grand coalition formed by various centrist liberal parties, Stressman made quick but effective reforms in his short period as chancellor. His first move was to end the strikes in the Ruhr. By September 1923, passive resistance was over, which meant that the government was not compensating workers anymore and relations with the Allies improved. His next move was to replace the old currency with the Rettenmark. This was done in November 1923, which stabilized Germany's currency and fixed the problem of hyperinflation. Stressman had to step down as chancellor as the SPD withdrew from his reshuffled government in November 1923. However, he was appointed foreign minister, a position from which he could take action to develop Germany. In August 1924, Stressman signed the DOS plan, which was a temporary measure that was designed to strengthen and stabilize Germany's economy. The plan agreed that America would lend Germany 800 million marks, and a five-year payment plan was set for Germany to pay back the war reparations. Later in August 1929, Stressman signed the Young Plan, which was a final statement on reparations. This plan was extremely helpful for Germany, as it reduced payments for reparations by 67% and annual payments were spread to be paid by 1988. The plans increased the Allies' trust and tremendously relieved Germany's economy. However, this came with a cost, as Germany was now very dependent on America's economy and the dollar. Between 1924 and 1929, Stressman also worked on a series of international agreements that set Germany on the international stage. These were the pacts signed. In 1925, the Locarno Pact was signed, which was mutually agreed peace between France, Germany, Great Britain, Belgium, and Italy. This pact confirmed the borders agreed on the Treaty of Versailles. In 1926, Germany finally joined the League of Nations. This increased the peace and cooperation with the Allies and also gave Germany a veto on the organization. 
Also in 1926, Germany and the USSR expanded on the Treaty of Rapallo, which was signed to improve relations between both nations and remove any territorial claims that each country had on each other. This new treaty was called the Treaty of Berlin, which agreed to maintain good relations and both countries pledged neutrality if one of them was attacked by a third party. In 1928, the kellogg bryan Pact was signed, which was a massive peacekeeping effort that almost all nations agreed to. The nations who joined agreed to settle disputes diplomatically instead of going to war. Stressman's final success was the end of the Allied occupation, as by 1930, all Allied troops were out of the Rhineland. These international treaties increased Germany's safety, peace and cooperation. However, these treaties also fueled extremism within Germany, as many Germans felt that they had been stabbed in the back by their own government by negotiating with the same countries that had led Germany to physical and economic ruin. Economic stability and improved living standards gave German people the freedom and time to involve in social and cultural activities. Many artists now had the freedom to express themselves without being killed or arrested. This lack of censorship in art meant that artists such as George Gross would include erotic scenes in their paintings, something that was not common in Imperial Germany. Some art would include political statements and messages criticizing the government, such as this painting by Gross named The Eclipse of the Sun. This painting critiques the violence of the German elite by showing General Ponven Hindenburg surrounded by mindless bureaucrats. To his left, an industrialist carrying weapons whispers in his ear. The German people are depicted as a donkey, listening with his big ears but yet blind to what is going on, focused on its food. The most disturbing part of the painting is under the table, which shows a young man behind metal bars and a skeleton, warning future generations. This type of critique in his art shows the freedom and how unrestricted artists were during the Weimar Republic. Other artistic movements such as Bauhaus became increasingly popular. Bauhaus was an architectural movement based on simplicity and minimalism. Some designs look very modern, and it's surreal to think that these designs are from 1920 and not 2020. Artists also express themselves through literature as freedom allowed writers to focus more on emotions instead of the plot. For example, All Quiet on the Western Front was an anti-war book that was relatable to many soldiers and widows as it showed the gruesome truths of the war. Cinema and theater became increasingly popular, and stars such as Marlene Dietrich rose to fame due to their unseen sexual, free, and realistic nature. People also felt comfortable attending clubs and cabarets in which erotic dances were performed and drinks were served. Acceptance of homosexuality and even cross-dressing grew. During this time, many groups benefited and suffered, some more than others. Vulnerable people such as veterans, orphans, widows, and the unemployed now benefited from state welfare as a public assistance system was in place. National unemployment insurance also helped the vulnerable. However, most of the systems had too many people, and many did not receive the necessary help. Women in the Weimar Republic felt freer, and had more rights now that they could vote and involve themselves in politics. By 1926, there were 32 women deputies in the Reichstag, three times as many women as there were in the House of Commons. More women joined the workplace. This was as women had to fill the spots of men when they went to war, and now it was seen as socially acceptable. However, women had no freedom when married and had no equal pay. Jewish people were more represented in society, and many were successful in business and in culture, such as Marlene Dietrich. However, hatred and anti-Semitism were quite common in society. Although many historians consider this era to be a golden age, not everybody enjoyed or participated. Many groups, specifically farmers, did not benefit from the economic growth due to global grain surplus and a price lump in 1925. Traditionalists and conservatives viewed cultural development as too much and felt threatened. Economic hardship and changes in society caused something called the backlash movement, which went against all the progress that the Republic was doing. Many of the people who supported the movement later supported the Nazi party, which after 1929 would rise in popularity. Thanks for watching. Please consider liking, subscribing, and checking other videos.